So here, I'm going to give you my phone. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, I've been a senator for a little over two weeks now and um, back and forth to D.C., but I wanted to get out to all 15 counties as fast as possible. Uh, obviously, I represent Cochise County, so I've been mm -hmm. representing uh, this community for a long time, uh, just strengthening relationships and meeting specifically with the mayors. Um, mayors are, their constituents are my constituents and uh, they're the closest uh, to the communities uh, to hear what's going on, you know, what are their federal issues, uh, you know, what are their uh, what's community you know, priorities and how can I help. So it's, it's a officially called a two-ear, one-mouth tour, <laughs> used proportionally. And um, so we've, we've gotten out to several of them so far and so today we're meeting we met with the Cochise County. And is this um, typically something that state senators do or is this something that you initiated? Uh, I initiated it. Um, I tend to chart my own path. So I, you know, my uh, opportunity to represent the whole state now, about seven million constituents, I wanna make sure that I'm very uh, quickly hearing what the priorities are so we can hit the ground running and get to work for the things that matter to our communities. Great, well going into your meeting today, what were um, some of the, the concerns that you heard from our county leadership? So uh, support to the military is really important. Obviously Fort Huachuca is uh, such a driving force of the economy here. Uh, so making sure that we're um, keeping our military uh, budget and predictability and spending, this is something that I've been you know, working with this community on for a long time. Really important for the local economy here. Water is a big issue all over the state. Uh, there's some unique water needs uh, in, in different communities. Um, and so you know, the one's very specific here related to the adjudication that's on the verge of uh, potentially uh, uh, happening uh, at some point that will you know, impact the opportunity for future development here in Sierra Vista. So we're keeping an eye on that. We've been familiar with it. Um, the uh, sewage flowing over from NACO continues to be uh, a very serious issue. Uh, that is ultimately Mexico's responsibility. Uh, we have been highly engaged on this. Um, there's been a lot of piecemeal efforts to try and stop it, but no real long-term solution. And um, so, so we're going to take that back again and continue to figure out what other agencies can we engage with uh, in our federal government in order to try and find a solution that ultimately Mexico is responsible for, but it's, it's impacting you know, our community here. Uh, talked a little bit about the opioid crisis and how it's impacting uh, some of the communities. Uh, we have uh, you know, passed some legislation already with some additional funding available for communities uh, to be addressing it, but also we got to stop it. Uh, we got to stop the, it's the demand and the supply and we need education and we need um, a treatment for people, uh, but they're primarily coming through the ports of entry, um, mm -hmm. the illicit drugs, and as there's been tremendous efforts at the federal and at the state level uh, to crack down on those who are illegally um, getting uh, uh, excessive uh, prescription drugs, then more individuals are going to the illicit, um, the illicit route. And uh, it's very difficult to detect uh, some of the, I mean, fentanyl the size of a fingernail could, you know, kill many people. So it's really challenging uh, to detect, but that is an issue at the ports of entry. It's a border security issue. Um, and so, you know, I've been advocating for the Douglas Port of Entry, as you know, this came up as well. Uh, feasibility study as we, uh, had anticipated or as I had hoped um, uh, is urging a two-port solution uh, as as we will fight for the funding uh, for for that project to, to come down uh, one of the things that's important in modernizing the port is that they've got the best technology and manpower and everything we need to be able to detect the illicit uh, drugs and contraband that's you know can come through ports of entry sometimes people just think of border security as just in between the ports of entry and I very much also focus at the ports of entry, um, in addition to the commerce opportunity and the jobs opportunity for the cross-border commerce. Um, so that were just you know some of the topics we talked about. It's a very diverse uh, county, as you know. So um, things that they're dealing with in, in Bisbee can be very different from in Wilcox and, and uh, serviced in other places. But it was a great uh, conversation uh, with the mayors from the county uh, to, again, we, I know them all already. We've been working with them. Ahuachuca City actually was a, a, a new, uh, new relationship. But just want to continue to grow those relationships, have the lines of communication, both with me and with my staff. Uh, so that we can help uh, solve problems that are at the federal level for these communities. So it's really productive. Uh, if, I might, yeah. if I might, we also touched on two other areas. Mm -hmm. uh, senior scams, which the center was involved in a hearing with yesterday, which is a growing problem throughout the state, 
especially in southern Arizona, yeah. and then uh, technology 5G in rural areas. Yeah, rural broadband, uh, rural access to the internet uh, came up for sure. Uh, and making sure that the the standards for rural areas for them to be able to apply for grants are keeping up with the realities of how we're living our lives and how technology is you know advancing. But yeah, I'm on the the select committee on aging. In addition to the armed services committee, the energy and natural resources committee, uh, the banking committee, and the Indian affairs committee. Uh, but we had a hearing on the select committee on aging uh, this week focused on senior scams with a growing aging population. Uh, there are uh, people out there that are continuing to try and take advantage of seniors uh, through increasingly sophisticated scam operations, uh, often over the phone, but also uh, online and, and at the door, you know, knocking on doors. So uh, on that committee, we were really uh, highlighting some of the things that need to, need, need to be done at the, you know, the, the, a lot of this is community and local state level, but also uh, at the federal level, what we can be doing to, uh, to support this. I've had in the past, um, in Green Valley, we had a, a senior scam sort of information session and brought in some other agencies and local communities just to raise awareness so that seniors can realize um, the different tactics that are being used. But the question I asked in the hearing this week was about how to get out to rural communities, because education is key. You know, education, educating individuals as far as the risks and the tactics and how they can, and what they need to do, like, don't answer the phone if you don't know the number. You know, let them leave a message, and if it's someone you know, call them back, which is a cultural difference from our generation to, you know, you guys are younger than me, but parents' generation, where they just, like, I have to answer the phone, I have to talk to somebody. Um, so even just, I've had to do this with my mom, you know, just educating seniors, like, no, you don't. No, you can hang up the phone, and uh, then you can block the number, and this is how you do it, and these are the types of tactics that they're using. Uh, there's just heartbreaking stories of people all over our state um, that have had their life savings taken from them because they, they fell prey to this. So we got to do more with our growing aging population, and we want to be a part of that. And sorry, one other issue, Chiricahua. Yes, the so Chiricahua National Monument, we had legislation uh, last year to uh, change that to a national park. That's something that's been an initiative uh, of this community. I'm really grateful for that. Uh, we ran into some... Um, um, challenges to move that forward in the past, but we're going to keep uh, pushing it now that we're on the Senate side and see if we can uh, move that forward for this community. So it sounds like you're really going to be able to carry on with some of the initiatives you started, you know, at the local level, even though you're a state senator now. Exactly, exactly. So if, if you are trying to fix something and it literally takes an act of Congress, which not everything does, not everything we talked about today does, but if it does, you got to get it through the House and you got to get it through the Senate, and you got to get it signed by the President. So that's always the approach that I took representing this community in the House, and now I'm in the Senate. I always ask the question first when something's brought to my attention to fix. Is this a federal issue? Because uh, sometimes it's a state issue or a local issue, and it's not even in the federal jurisdiction, or it shouldn't be. And if it is a federal issue, like, what can we do about it? Is it something we can engage with the administration or the authorities in uh, the executive branch uh, in order for them to, you know, fix or address, or is it, you know, uh, some sort of oversight issue we have with them, or a funding issue, maybe there's a grant that the local community can apply for and we can, um, you know, provide support to that, and that's one role uh, to, uh, you know, to push on things. For example, the, the Douglas Port of Entry, that didn't take an act of Congress, but in my role as a representative here and chairing the Border Security Subcommittee, I was uh, relentlessly advocating for how important it was to modernize it, uh, brought a number of federal officials down here to see it firsthand, uh, raised it in hearings, raised it in letters, you know, did very much the squeaky wheel approach uh, about how important this modernization is for both security and commerce. And uh, it then was put on the five-year uh, plan, and then we had a feasibility study funded for it. And so now we need to, you know, take that next step. Uh, so I'm continuing that in the Senate. As a senator instead of a House member, it's still the same advocacy. But if we're talking about legislation, like the Chiricahua uh, Monument, that actually takes an act of Congress. So we have to get it through the House and through the Senate and signed by the President. So now I can introduce that bill over in the Senate and partner with the House members and see if we can move it forward uh, to get it done. 
And Senator, speaking of border security, that's a big concern for a lot of our readers out here. Um, what, in your opinion, needs to be done to secure our border down here? As it should be. I mean, I've had the privilege uh, to represent a uh, border community 80 miles of the border, and I represent all of, all of Arizona. And this isn't just uh, some sort of political game to them. I mean, we do have cartels trafficking through our community. It's a public safety threat. Uh, they have become more well-funded, uh, certainly more innovated, more dangerous at times, and uh, the drug crisis as well that uh, the cartels are profiting from. This is a very real issue. Um, they, certainly the, the new administration has a greater will to secure the border, uh, but there has been a lot of uh, resistance and obstruction to doing that. Uh, I'm going to continue to be an advocate uh, for our community here, for solutions that provide the resources and the policies and fix some of the laws that we have so that we can actually secure the border. Uh, we have a very robust and generous legal immigration system. I mean, a million people a year get green cards. We have an asylum process, we have a refugee process, but basically it's being taken advantage of in some cases uh, because of some loopholes that we have. Uh, but then we just have uh, operatives that are also preying upon people, creating a humanitarian crisis, uh, trafficking, trafficking them here. And so we've got to secure the border. It does include physical barriers. Uh, you know, just in the community here, uh, over the last few years, some of the old fencing was replaced with some of the new types of barriers. That was approved by Barack Obama when he was the president. Uh, you know, he voted for the Secure Fence Act when he was a senator, mandating 700 miles of some sort of barrier on the southern border. Uh, so we need to come to the table and negotiate a solution that gets us out of the shutdown uh, and secures the border, which will, needs to include barriers. Uh, I think the, you know, the uh, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi need to stop playing games with this. Um, we're trying to break through the gridlock with um, some Democrats in the Senate uh, who don't want this con to continue and don't, f well, I don't want to speak for them, but are saying, like, let's try and work through the uh, supplemental appropriations request that came over from the White House. Uh, that is a very reasonable request, which is funding for border security to include bar barriers, to include border patrol agents to include uh, detection equipment at the ports of entry, things that most Americans and most Arizonans agree that we need. So let's sit down at the table, work this through, and let's get something on the president's desk to open up the government and secure the border. That's been my approach. And do you feel that immigration reform could play a part in improve border security? I, I think we need to modernize our immigration system. It's certainly broken. Everybody knows it. Uh, and it's been going on for decades and decades. So we've got to fix the legal immigration system. Uh, we have to address some of the uh, issues that we're dealing with in our communities because it's been broken for so long and nothing's been done. Uh, we've got to secure our border. We've got to also deal with visa overstays. That's another element of you know the illegal immigration system where uh, a lot of people are over staying their visas and uh, that's in, in some cases those numbers are even higher than those who we uh, apprehend who have crossed the border illegally. So we have to do all of it. Um, I, I realize these are challenging political issues for some people. Uh, I take my approach that I had in the military which is let's solve the problem. We know what the problems are. We've got to put the resources and the assets and the will and the policies to secure the border. Let them keep the bad stuff out. Uh, we need to let the good stuff in and we need a way that uh, does that that meets our economic needs. Um, move us more towards a, a modernized Im uh, legal immigration system. We have a million people a year that get green cards. It's a very generous system. Uh, so how do we have that be more about like what we need in our economy right now? It's not lined up with that. Everywhere I go, we've got a strong economy right now. Everywhere I go, businesses are challenged for workers. Uh, and that's on all ends of the spectrum, whether it's in the agricultural field, uh, it, it, through which we need to modernize the guest worker program, or whether it's um, you know engineers uh, you know working on the high level projects that are really important for us in our in our future. So we got to figure that. We got to get Americans off the sideline uh, so that they have the right skills for the jobs that they have. But we need our immigration system to be more responsive to uh, what our economic needs are. It's broken. I'm trying. I've been trying to fix it for a long time. Uh, I don't think we should pile all these issues onto one solution at this moment in order to get the government open and provide the funding that we need this year for border security. Uh, I think there are some conversations we could have, and the, and the President has already said he's willing to talk about the DACA population being a part of that. I've been part of these negotiations now for a couple of years when I was over in the House. Um, we just need 
the Democrat leadership and the Senate and the House to seriously come and negotiate. I think there is a deal to be had that's good for border security and moves us in the right direction. They need to stop playing politics with it. And so, so how is that going, trying to reopen the government? <laughs> it's extremely challenging. I mean, I've been talking to a number of other senators. I've been talking to the White House. Um, and uh, again, we are working on an initiative with a number of senators on both sides of the aisle trying to uh, see if there's a way forward that uh, we could offer um, to, to give us a few weeks to mark up and work on the appropriations supplemental request that came over um, and negotiate in good faith uh, to see if we can find some common ground from the bottom up because what I've, I've just it just seems that um, Senator Schumer and and Speaker Pelosi are not seriously they're not serious about negotiating from my view they're just trying to deny President Trump anything on border security and that's really what not what the American people want and that's not what my community that I represent wants uh, so let's figure it out and let's move forward so I, we're trying to do a little bit more of a bottom-up approach right now to maybe um, create a little pressure on um, those who are representing the Democrats right now uh, to change their tactic. Now, have you done anything to ensure that our federal workers are able to pay their bills yeah. in the meantime? <laughs> well, the first thing I've done is I've withhold uh, withholding my pay. Uh, I think it's inappropriate for members of Congress who are responsible, uh, you know, with the executive branch to solving this, to be getting paid while other people right now are working every single day in uh, our border patrol, uh, at the ports of entry, and other key essential jobs, and they're not being paid. So my pay is being withheld. Uh, I've signed on a bill, no budget, no pay, saying in the future, if, uh, if uh, politicians can't get their act together in Washington, D.C., and actually pass a budget and the appropriations bills by the fiscal deadline, then you don't get paid. And you know maybe some of these people don't need that, or that's not you know wouldn't motivate them. But I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, it's, I just think it's hypocritical when people are um, saying saying one thing and and, and others are others in, are in different circumstances that are being impacted by all this. So I'm withholding my pay. I'm on the no budget, no pay act, and then I also have introduced legislation, Pay Our Protectors Act, that ensures that those that are out there right now today that are working in law enforcement and doing their jobs and they've already missed their first paycheck, that they get paid through this through this shutdown and uh, move that forward. So we're talking to, again, the White House and other senators, is there a way for us to move something narrow like that forward in the in the midst of this impasse in order for those who are, who are actually out there working for them to be paid? So I'm going to keep working on it. Right. Well, Senator, I'm going to do a bit of an 180 because this is another issue that's important yeah. for our readers. Um, how will you continue supporting Fort Huachuca in your new position? Well, you know, as someone who has first-hand experience of what an amazing national security asset Fort Huachuca is, I'm going to continue to advocate for it and its missions that are there to stay there and to grow our missions. It's, it is such, it has such niche capabilities there when it comes to intelligence or unmanned aerial vehicles and cyber and the electronic proving grounds. I mean, I know these firsthand, uh, both as a member of the military and as someone who's already represented this community brought the first ever Secretary of Defense down here uh, under the last administration and uh, the Chief of Staff of the Army. So I'm going to continue on the Senate Armed Services Committee to advocate for, for Fort Huachuca, to advocate for our troops, uh, and specifically for the missions there, because it's so important as we look forward to what our military needs to keep us safe. Uh, it's these, what I call, asymmetrical capabilities that we have here at Fort Huachuca that are going to be so critical. Uh, for our national security. So I think these mission areas only have the potential to grow. And we've got to make sure that we get leaders out here to see it firsthand um, because it's a, it's a treasure out here that often they don't realize fully until they meet the commanders, they see the base, and they see how valuable it is. So we might get some more visits from you up here. We'll in the see, future. we'll see. <laughs> Right. Uh, Senator, I had another question for you. Um, are you planning to, or do you feel <laughs> any of the initiatives that Senator McCain started, are, are you going to continue them, or do you feel it is important to continue them? Are there any in particular? Obviously, he is a strong advocate for our Are there any that are important for you? Senator McCain, as the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee and as a champion for our military for his whole life, um, you know, his shoes cannot be filled in that regard. Um, and and I, I think many many people have don't, are, aren't realizing they are starting to realize the 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 magnitude of that loss of that voice that strong voice and in the position that he, he was in. Um, so on my part, I am going to do my part to continue to advocate for our military uh, from my firsthand experience. Make sure we keep our country safe. Make sure our troops have everything they need. 
Um, I mean, it's so important, especially as fellow veterans, to be able to do that. Um, so yeah, absolutely, I'll be following his footsteps in that regard. I mean, there's other things. We were picking up where we worked with Senator McCain on. We were in the House and he was in the Senate. And we're looking at those things and figuring out which ones can we move forward now on the Senate side as well. So we'll look at them issue by issue. If there's any other particular issue, I'm happy to, you know, happy to reflect on that. But uh, it's big shoes to fill. Yeah, kind of speaking of that, I've been kind of curious to know what is it, what is it like sort of carrying on the legacy of this American icon? Well, I, I don't think I, I can, nobody can. So I, I, um, uh, I look at it like I've been given this opportunity to serve uh, in, this, uh, in this position. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take the same approach as Senator McCain of country first, service before self. We had similar core values in the Navy, in the Air Force. In the Air Force, it was integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all we do. So bringing those core values uh, to the Senate uh, and following in his footsteps in the sense of my decision making, like what's the right thing to do for our country? What's the right thing to do for our state? And do that in my own way. I mean, I, I am my own individual with my own, you know, my own uh, experiences in life and the things that, the different committees and things that I'm on. Uh, so I will be, charging my own path, but uh, um, it, you know, it is an absolute honor to be there and, uh, and to be having the opportunity to serve for these next few years at such a critical time for our country, and I, I'm very, very humbled by this opportunity. Well, I know a lot of folks out here are happy to see you in this new yeah. position, so thank you for coming in. Well, if you think about it, um, we've only had two senators ever in our history from Southern Arizona. And so, I mean, I live in Tucson. I don't, I don't live in Cochise County, but I'm a Southern Arizona senator, and that's only happened one other time in our history as a state. Uh, I'm gonna represent the whole state, but I come from representing this community first. And so these relationships and this understanding of all the issues down here and advocating for them is something that I'm gonna continue in the Senate, and I hope people see that there is real value in that. That, that was actually, <clears throat> excuse me, something we were discussing earlier where um, you know, previously as a representative, um, when you're in the House, your constituent base was much smaller right. than you're dealing with <coughs> Cochise County, Port of Pima, Pima yeah. County, um, whereas now you've got the entire, the entire state. Yeah. Were there um, any concerns expressed or, I guess, questions asked today about, um, you know, whether your continued support here locally in Cochise County um, whether that might be diluted a little bit just by the, uh, you know, yeah. because your constituent base is so much larger. No, not at all. I think, I mean, what we heard is the exact opposite. The reality is, again, you do represent statewide in the Senate. Uh, you have a new representative in the House, right, who, uh, as the Founding Fathers set it up, has that, you know, closer constituency with nine, rep nine representatives. But I've come from that place representing you all for four years. So, I mean, I know very well uh, what the issues are here, and we'll continue to carry them for them. I, you know, I can't physically be present uh, everywhere all at once. Um, nobody wants to meet with me between midnight and 5 a.m. is usually the joke, which is when I'm free. Uh, so we're going to have to be around the state. It's a, it's a uh, responsibility for me to be all over the state. But just know, uh, you know, I get the issues. Our relationships are there, and I'm going to be, you know, present and advocating uh, for Coaches County, just like I have in the past, but over in the Senate. You, uh, you also mentioned. Uh you know, when you're when you're named to, to fill the seat, uh, that you had worked, you know, that you had worked with uh, Congresswoman Cinema before, yeah, uh, and that you look forward to working with her again. Have you guys had any conversations yet? Or? Yeah, we have, and in fact, uh, my first three bills I introduced were some land exchange bills on a variety of land exchange issues around the state, and we had been on those bills in the past and in the House. And so you need a House and Senate version, and so uh, she co-sponsored those few bills as we introduced them in our in our first week in office. And uh, we're looking for the other areas that we had common ground and we worked on in the House where we can, you know, again pull these issues over to the Senate. Sometimes there were already Senate champions on an issue, so we'll figure out how we just get on with them and work with them. And um, we'll our staffs will continue to work together, and, and and we've had some conversations as well. So look, campaign's over. <laughs> And it's time for us to govern, and it's time for us to um, do what's best for Arizonans uh, while we have this opportunity in the Senate. That's the approach that I'm taking. And uh, you know, like like any athlete, you go out there on the field, you give it all you got, you high five at the end, and you go out and get a beer, you know, at the end of it. So we're both now representing Arizona, and so this is about the future. And I'm really looking forward to partnering with her and working together with her. There are many things that we can work on together, even though. 
were uh, of different parties. And I think that's what the vast majority of people are looking for. They're sincerely held strong views across our state about a lot of issues and sincerely held different views between Senator Sinema and I on issues. And we know where those generally those disagreements are. And we need to have those debates and discussions as we uh, move forward on those issues. But there's a whole lot of areas of, of common ground. Uh, that we can uh, work together uh, for the betterment of the people that we re represent. And that's what I've focused on since I've been in the House. You guys saw that, you know, since I've been there. I, I, I you know, I, I figure out, like, what can we actually get done and then tirelessly advocate to get it done. And uh, I, I think, well, all the 20 bills that got passed through the House and five signed into law were all bipartisan bills. So there is, uh, there are a lot of places where we can work together. So I just wanted to add that the, 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 these mayor uh, meetings, uh, this is the second one I've sat in uh, personally, what, uh, the fourth or fifth one? Fifth. Yeah, fifth one. Uh, last Saturday was Pima County, and it uh, was Maricopa County, two. East and Valley, Pinal West Valley, and Pinal County. And Pinal County. <laughs> and what's interesting is uh, among mayors, there is a lot of common ground, too. Mm -hmm. All of them express a concern about the government shutdown, for example, uh, water issues. Uh, uh, you know, so there's a lot of common interest among cities. There are exclusive issues, too. You guys care about Chiricahua more than, you know, uh, folks in another county, but there are always going to be regional things like that that loom large locally. But there's so much in common that I think comes through with these uh, meetings, which makes tours like this so valuable because then you get this sort of holistic approach and you can see, well, all my constituents, all my mayors care about this. Mm -hmm. and, and how often will you, will you do these tours? Hmm? How often will you do these tours? So, I mean, <laughs> my intent is we're starting off to get all 15 counties in, and then, of course, this is this is just starting off, and then we'll be back and visiting all the counties as different events happen, or uh, however that works in our schedule back when we're back and forth to D.C. But I want to hit the ground running, and one way to get around to all 15 counties and to hear immediately what the top priorities are, we felt the best way was to talk to the mayors. You may have addressed this before I got into the room, if so, yeah. forgive me, but... Uh, <laughs> Was there uh, was there one issue or one um, you know one thing that, that the mayors that, that you spoke with today were kind of unified and pushing for or advocating? Yeah, we did go through a, a list Sorry. of all the issues, but well, I, yeah, I would yeah, say I um, one in addition to what we talked about, actually, border security was one of them. Yeah, okay. uh, that was again. There were some unique, specific issues for each each town uh, locality. Um, uh, co certainly a c common uh, support for Fort Huachuca uh, and the Douglas Port of Entry, but they all talked about the importance of border security uh, for our communities and um, the, the, again, because this is a border community. Now, it doesn't mean we shouldn't have people come here on vacation and come spend their money and, <coughs> you know, businesses relocating here, uh, but, we've, but we've got to deal with it. So we, we, we want to make sure that people understand there is a problem, the problem needs to be fixed, uh, but we don't want to scare, uh, you know, scare people away who uh, we want to welcome into our community as well. Mm -hmm. Actually, Mayor Mueller said, sorry, former reporter, he said, we, we appreciate your stance on uh, the border. Uh, I think we all agree. I mean, you can check with him on this, but that was, I think. Well, that's on film now, CJ. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was the, one of the first topics yeah. uh, that yeah. uh, they spoke about, and they were all uh, near unanimous, uh, you, you know, I think unanimous on this, to on this topic. Did you hear any, you, uh, obviously, the issue's been discussed far and wide for a long time now. Yeah. Did you hear any unique suggestions or ideas come to the table? Today? Well, again, we we generally know what we need. Like, we need barriers where appropriate. We need access roads where we don't have them so the Border Patrol can get to the border. We need technology uh, that works to be able to quickly uh, identify uh, the uh, illegal activity that's happening, and that includes tunneling technology, <coughs> the technology that's um, uh, identifying where they're shooting stuff over the barriers or when they're approaching and cutting through the barriers. Uh, we need an intelligence-driven uh, approach. We need enough Border Patrol agents that are patrolling at the border. Um, these things we've been talking about now for four years since I've been in the House, and every little area of the border is not going to be exactly the same and the cartels are going to be responsive and change their tactics so we have to also be nimble and light on our feet 
to see what their changing tactics are so that we can uh, adjust what we're doing in order to, to crack down on the illegal activity. Mm -hmm. So it's not rocket science. Uh, we generally know what it needs and you know what they need around the Rio Grande River is going to be a little bit different than what they need uh, in, in Douglas and Naco. Uh, but we also need support at the ports of entry, which is what I keep advocating for uh, with fellow senators. Uh, in the White House, like, hey, border security equals in between the ports of entry and at the ports of entry. That includes modernizing the infrastructure, it includes the detection technology, uh, and the, the, C the, uh, the CBP officers, the blue suitors at the ports of entry who are also undermanned. Uh, that was my first bill signed in the law, was fast tracking our veterans for the jobs at the ports of entry. So um, and these solutions are, are going to really make a difference. We just need to stop the political theater and the obstruction from actually making them happen. Will these solutions kind of mitigate some of the humanitarian things we're seeing, like family separation, migrant caravans? Yes, absolutely, forward? because what we're seeing is because of the lack of resources and the loopholes in our laws that are being taken advantage of, it's basically a draw for additional uh, organization of, of illegal activity that, that creates another high humanitarian crisis uh, for the trip that people are, are taking. So. If you read uh, the administration's supplemental request, which if you don't have a copy for it, we can get it to you. It came over to the Senate about 12 or 13 days ago. Uh, it includes some modifications for how they process asylum claims of minors and others in country. Uh, so that you don't have people making this dangerous trek often while the cartels profit from trafficking them on this dangerous trek. Uh, so that we can kind of manage that not all coming up and happening right, uh, you know, right at the border. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that need to be addressed, but again, the cartels realize when they can take advantage of a loophole that, that uh, needs to be changed in the law, and then you'll see the, the spike in the change in the type of activity based on that. So we gotta be able to fix this, and a lot of it does take Congress to do. That's our job. So I, I would ask my Democrat colleagues, let's come to the table and let's negotiate in good faith to solve this. Uh, this is not a game. There are people that are hurting. The border is not secure. Uh, we've got people working right now that are not being paid. Uh, the right thing to do is to solve this problem, get it done, secure a border, and get back to work.